Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And with me today, uh, are, uh, we're going to have a great conversation about a new technique that uh, involves uh, measuring, measure, using, using the Hubble Space Telescope to measure stellar distances. And with me today is uh, uh, Dr. Carol Christian. She is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope Science Outreach uh, Astronomer. Hi, Carol. There's my little wave. <laughs> yeah, the, the royal, the royal we. Um, also with me is uh, Scott Lewis, co-hosting. Hi, Scott. And how's it going, Tony? Good. And um, Dr. Uh, Ian O'Neill. He's the uh, he's the uh, space editor for Discovery.com or DiscoveryNews.com. Uh, hi, Ian. Thanks for coming. Hi, Tony. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for being here. Also, uh, I'm very pleased to have in our hangouts uh, uh, for the second time now, Dr. Adam Reese. The uh, he's an astronomer at the Johns Hopkins University and uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, and a Nobel laureate from 2011. Hi, Adam. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> hey, and uh, Dr. Stefano. Good to be here for the second time. Yeah. Uh, you're uh, also is uh, Stefano Casertano from the also from the Space Telescope Science Institute, an astronomer who has worked with Dr. Reese on this new technique. So let's Hi. go ahead and get started. But before we do, um, I want to mention that you can interact with us in a lot of different ways. You can leave comments and questions on our Q and A app on the Google uh, event page. You can also tweet using the Hubble hashtag or Hubble Hangout hashtag. Whew, a lot of H's. Oh, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> Hubble Hangout hashtag. Uh, you can also uh, leave comments on the YouTube uh, watch page where this is being uh, broadcast. So we hope you will leave us some comments and questions, and we'll get to them hopefully by the time uh, uh, before we have to uh, close out the uh, the hangout. So, uh, Carol. Yes. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good too. Where I want to talk about stellar distances, and I wonder if yes. you could give us a background, just a little bit of background on how do we know. How far away stuff is out there? Yeah, exactly. So this will be a really, really short because there are many methods because astronomers are very clever, and the thing is that we can't go there. So on on Earth, you know, of course, we use a tape measure or a ruler, and we also use surveying. So you probably either have used sur survey tools or you've seen people use surveys like to measure a road. Um, a building, something like that, and the way that works really is that um, you take a reading from uh, one position and then you move to another position and you use geometry, you know the distance between your two measuring positions and then you can figure out from geometry how far away something is. And so in astronomy, since the distance are, are far, we use actually the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. We know how big that distance is, so we take an observation on one side um, of the Sun and then six months later on the other side. And uh, usually, and there's the diagram showing that, and of course we take lots of measurements, not just two, and that gives us the distance to the star. Um, but then we get to distances that are very hard to distinguish when we take the observation, even with Hubble, um, or traditionally with Hubble, and so the stars are too far away. So then we start using more indirect techniques, and we use things called standard candles, and we also use objects where we can model how bright we think they are, look at them and say, oh, they're th a certain brightness. So the distance to them, um, understanding how light works, uh, is then X or Y. So some of the objects that we're particularly interested in, the more nearby objects, are called Cepheid variables. They change in a very particular way that we understand, and when we discover them and we measure how bright we see them, and we know how intrinsically bright they are, then we know the distance. And then there are other objects, and one of the most distant objects that we can use are supernova, and that's what Adam and his colleagues have been measuring. But it turns out that going back to the direct method, this parallax method is very powerful because it's a direct geometric measurement. And so there's no modeling or anything like that associated with it. And that's what Adam is, and his colleagues are going to talk about. Okay, so this, yeah, you know, so the geometric method you were talking about, that's called parallax, and up to now it's been, I, I think I read in, uh, that it has been, it's the more reliable way, the most reliable way uh, to measure how far away something is because 
It's a direct measurement. We're actually... Yes, it's a direct measurement, and we're not modeling anything. We're not saying, oh, the star sh or the galaxy or the cluster should be this bright or this temperature. We don't have to model anything. It's a direct measurement. It's just how we do surveying on the ground. But it's not accurate, like you said. It's only good for a certain distance away, right? So, Adam... Yeah, and then you can't take images that, I mean, traditionally, telescopes couldn't take such precise images measurements um, out to it, you know, at a certain distance, then you never see the star. It, it never changes place, so then, then you can't me measure the distance. Yeah, the way I always describe it to people is I say, look, you take your finger and you hold it out at arm's length. Well, yes, and, and that's, that's parallax because you have... A, that's right, that's what I'm saying, with, with the parallax. And, and observation you, A, observation B. Yeah, and you, and you blink one eye and then the other and you'll see if you look against the background walls, whatever object you're, you're looking up against back there, it will appear to shift a little bit based on the distance because the distance of each vantage point of each eyeball is a little bit different. And so it, the, the line of sight is slightly different. And so that's what the effect is we're talking about. And Adam, how good has this been traditionally as a technique for measuring things? Are you there? Um, well, uh, it's still pretty hard. Can you hear me? Can yep, you hear me I can okay? hear you. Yeah. Yep. Are you hearing me, Tony? Yep, okay. we can hear um, you. You know, it, it's been hard simply because stars are really, really far away. Okay. Um, stars are just really far away, and so these angles, even when, when we use as a, a baseline the whole uh, orbit of the Earth, those angles are incredibly small. Even for the very nearest stars, they're as small as one arc second, so one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. Yeah, and uh, how far away, do, when does this generally stop working? How far away are objects generally where you just can't see the shift anymore? Right, so as technology has improved, we've been able to go further and further out, um, but uh, that still is only uh, out to a relatively small fraction of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so uh, the Hipparco satellite that the European Space Agency used uh, in the 1980s uh, could measure parallax to about one milli arc second, um, which was good enough to... Uh, get well-measured distances to stars that were, um, you know, something like under 100 parsecs, maybe 50 parsecs. Okay, so uh, can you, what, what's that, so 50 parsecs, that's about what in roughly light years? I'm having to... 150 light years. About 150? Right. Okay. So, so with this new technique, uh, we can measure well out to about 10,000 light years. Oh, okay. So... Jump. Yeah, that's okay. That, yeah, I want to get to that. So, so let's let's talk about this. I'm I'm, I'm going to pull up the uh, the uh, this this diagram that we have from the the press release, and I would like you guys to talk about this a little bit. It says here that um, generally we're able to see things, uh, you know, up to now, uh, uh, according to the way things have been done, about 750 light years away. Uh, but you guys have found a way to increase that by a factor of 10. What are you guys doing that? That makes it. I mean, that's quite a big jump. How a factor of ten? Yeah. I mean, wow. So what? What's going on here? We just try really hard. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> that, magical. It's that magical. makes most of the difference. It turns <laughs> yeah. out. Well, well, I guess people have a little bit of space elbow grease, and you're good. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's a very clever technique. He's <laughs> well, let's hear about it. Let's let so let's hear about it. So according to according to this this diagram, now you can see things, or you can measure things reasonably well out to about 7,500 light years using this technique. And these are all, by the way, I should mention, stars, These are this obviously because of the distances involved, we're talking about things in our galaxy. So we're not talking about other galaxies or, or things like that. We're, we're, we're looking primarily in our own stellar neighborhood, more or less. So Stefano, what, right. what happened? The, the Hubble Space Telescope is almost 25 years old, and here you guys are figuring out new ways to make it even better. So wh what's the deal? Well, what it, what's happened is that we found a method, um, Adam and collaborators and myself, have found a method to actually do a thousand measurements in one image of the same object. 
So basically what happens is instead of taking a, a stellar field and staring at it for 10 minutes, which is a normal way of observing, what we do is we move the telescope while we are staring at it. And so that makes each, each star makes a long image where every, every piece of the image can be made as a separate measurement. And so over the course of 10 minutes, instead of making one measurement, we make, we make a thousand. Okay, you have, some, you have something to illustrate, says. Why don't you put that up real quick? Yeah, let me try that. Um, so what this is, is basically, uh, this is simulation really. Uh, it's too hard to do it in, for a real field, but uh, it's a it's a star field, and the square you see there is basically the imprint of the of the camera that we are using to look at it. And at the beginning, that's where that's where the telescope is. Then the telescope starts moving, and I'm going to start the simulation here. And then we open the shutter, and these are the trails of each star, and each of them, you know, gets observed many many times over many pixels. This uh, in this camera. So and you're moving the telescope. You're moving the Hubble now. Yeah, we're moving the telescope while we're taking the exposure, while the shutter of the camera is open. So basically, the, the stars all move, and that, that means that every time that you get a new image of the star, one pixel down, one other pixel down, another pixel down, you make a new measurement of, this, of how far from each other all these stars are. And that basically turns out into over a thousand measurements for each star, and, and that's in a single, in a single observation. So that's why we get a factor of almost 10 because we can, well, actually more than 10 because we make multiple observations every time. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble getting this. So your, the actual measurement, the geometric measurement is the shift in the background stars, right? I, right. Well, how do you get that from this star trail? So, so we compare so the this, stars to well, each other. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I was just going to say, so the goal is every six months to measure the separation between our target star, the one we're trying to measure the distance to, and all the background stars. And we can only measure the position of a star so well, um, and so as Stefano described, by uh, trailing the telescope, we're essentially getting a thousand independent measurements of the separation between the target star and all the other stars. So we're leveraging the ability to make many measurements, and so we reduce the uncertainty by averaging. So it's basically increasing the precision, the precision of your measurement, basically. And that's what's making right. it better? That, um, so it increases the precision by about a factor of 10, and it's that precision with, which limits how far away you can measure stars, because when the stars become too far away, you can't tell that the star, the target star has moved. over six months. And so this allows us to detect smaller and smaller movements, which is to say further and further away stars. So what, at one period in, in the orbit then, in Earth's orbit, you take uh, one of these fields and you do the, the thousands of measurements and then six months later the Earth is on the other side of its orbit um, and the farthest distance it can be from the previous measurement and you do it again. And then you compare these two, which each each of which have thousands of measurements in them. So statistically, you've got a lot more measurements than if you had just taken one image and looked at the star right. and measured those. Yeah. And Precisely. Okay. That's right. And just to give you an idea how small these shifts are, we're, we're looking... Oh, I... I'm sorry, Adam, but you're cutting out again. Um, can you, you? The last thing I heard was to give you an idea how small these small these shifts are. Are you there? Uh, I think. Did you? Right. Do you, the, do you the shift. Yeah. Can you? Can you I'm hear me? sorry. Yeah, it's just not a good connection, Adam. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now for a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. It seems like that network is just not working for you. Um, yeah, the last thing we heard was to give you an okay. idea how small the ships are. It, it seems like there's a bit, bit of a delay. Yeah. Yeah, um, the ships are about one one hundredth of a single pixel on HST, and we need to measure, therefore, to a precision of about one one thousandth of a pixel to see that shift well. Okay, so so now you're using the variation, or you're using the interpixel, your measurement smaller than the size of a pixel on the camera, and getting the getting the positions based on where it is on the pixel, uh, 
and in order to do that accurately, you're saying you've got to be able to do that uh, to within a, a even smaller degree than the pixel size. Is that right? Am I getting yes. that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. Well, um, so who who thought this up? Was that was that you, Adam, or was it was it Stefano, or did it did, did it come to you from a? Oh, I think we lost him again. Yeah, well, um, so actually, this was not invented specifically for this purpose. Uh, Adam and I figured out it could be used for this, but originally they used the they developed this technique. Uh, the we see three group at uh, STSCI developed this technique to be able to observe very bright stars uh, which had planets, and so they could measure their brightness even though they were so bright they would completely flood the camera, and also they could see how. Tiny variations in luminosity. Sorry, the network seems to have slowed. When the planet was having a transit, but uh, then Adam Down. thought of they could hijack this technique for our purposes, and that's where I also started to help. Is this something that uh, ground-based instruments can do as well, or is it uh, is it primarily something well suited for a space telescope? Well, well, they could do it, but they couldn't do it with the kind of precision that Hubble has. Yeah, because that's the one thing Hubble has that most um, right. Hubble are most ground based. Go ahead, go ahead, Adam. I right, think Hubble already out. Hubble already has a factor of ten better resolution than most ground based telescopes. So you already start out ten times better. Then you use this technique to get ten times better still. If you use the technique from the ground without Hubble's resolution. Maybe you could get as good as Hubble's resolution without the technique. So yeah, one of the we should talk about that a little bit. One of the things that space telescopes and Hubble in particular has over ground-based telescopes, because let's face it, Hubble is not the biggest telescope we've ever used to look in, into space with, but it is got a vantage point that makes it truly unique in the sense that it doesn't have to worry about the atmosphere. The atmosphere smears everything out. Don't, I don't care how good your telescope is on the ground, you've still got to look through the atmosphere. And that's why you always see these people building observatories in high mountains, but not just high mountains, high dry mountains, like on Mauna Kea or in the, the, uh, the mountains in Chile, because they are very good for, they have very dry air that is relatively stable. And even with that, though, they still can't get uh, as, as nice of a resolution as Hubble does unless they use uh, tricks and techniques like adaptive optics and things like that where they can really do a pretty good job. Um, so Hubble being almost 25 years old now is still being discovered, I mean used in ways in truly novel ways. Uh, I mean like with frontier fields using galaxy lenses to or gravitational lenses to uh, see further away because the mirror is only as big as it is, uh, can't see, it can only see so far back, uh, they use gravity lenses to boost its power. Here's another technique by averaging, or not averaging, but, but getting statistically more measurements over time uh, where they're able to increase a, a measurement that's really hard to make, like Adam said, uh, 10 times better. Now, why is it so important, guys? And I'll give this to either Stefano or, or uh, Carol or uh, Adam, whichever one want to answer this, but why is it so important to know these things so precisely? Why can't we just have a rough idea? Well, Stefano can go ahead. Um, okay, go ahead, Stefano. Well, so the, the, the trick is that these stars are special. The, the Cepheid stars that we're observing are special. They vary periodically very in a very stable way, and their, very, their variability is a very good indicator of their luminosity. Now, they're also very bright, which means we can see them in distant galaxies. So basically, these Cepheids are, are, can become and are becoming our primary ruler to measure the size of the universe. So basically, if we've made an error of, let's say, 5% in the distance to a Cepheid, we make an error of 5% in our ruler. And okay, so we wouldn't know. But now I should, I should point out that you're talking about something different now. You're not talking about parallax anymore. You're talking about a new way of measuring distance, which is in Cepheid variables. And well, well, the thing is that if you only measure Cepheids that are close to uh, us, uh, then then you only you've only calibrated the Cepheids in our region, Got and it. then you say, oh, all the other Cepheids are the same. Well, what if they're not? 
Right. So you really have to directly measure Cepheids further and further out so you can make sure that we really understand Cepheids as we move out in the universe and then, then we can rely on them as a measurement tool. Okay, so I want to go back. To, we've got to take a quick step back here. We've already okay. talked about Cepheid <laughs> variables. These are variable stars that get bright and dim again and bright and dim again and the, and the period, the, the, the length of time it takes them to go from one brightness to another, that is related to ha how bright that star really is. If you were standing right next to that star, you would know how bright it is intrinsically. Well, we can get that um, by watching how it mo gets bright and dim again. That's called its intrinsic brightness. Once you know something's intrinsic brightness, you know how bright something is if you're right next to it, and then you see it far away, it's a simple calculation, well not simple, but it's a calculation you can do to figure out how far away it is. If you, if you have a candle right next to you, right next to your eyeball, it's a certain brightness. You know how it, its distance is zero. You move that candle a hundred feet away, it's going to be dimmer. dimmer. You measure the difference in, in brightness and you can figure out how far away it is. But you got to know to begin with how bright it really is if it's right next to you. And that's what they're talking about with these C-feed variables is they're, it's Period, its period of brightness is related to its luminosity. And by doing the parallax measurement on close stars, you get a better idea of that variability, intrinsic right, Carol? Bright. Yeah, intrinsic yeah. brightness. So okay. that now we've measured, you know, it's not a 60.5 watt, you know, light bulb, it's a 60 watt light bulb, if you will. I mean, there's it's reducing that error, but it's also using the fact that it's a direct geometric measurement because this thing of things moving around I go back to your diagram it's really angles that we're measuring and we're using the geometry of the situation and that movement is a measurement of an angle um, as we see our target object moving back and forth relative to the very distant things so it's really geometry I've got an animation here that I want to share that might yes, help that with was, yeah, uh, yeah, visualizing yeah, what we're talking up. about. So let me put this up here real quick. And there we go. So as everything's moving around, we're seeing that these stars are moving compared to what's behind it, or what's behind it compared to that star that we're focusing on. So, yes, you're seeing uh, the orbit of the Earth right. going and around. Right, these little TV screens come up and show you how, how we measure the stars as they move back and forth. So that's what you're actually measuring, that, that shift there, uh, the back and forth motion. And the further away, the smaller the motion, and if you're limited by your technology, then you can only measure them so far out, and now they've improved the technique so that they can measure it 10 times further away. And yeah. now we're, we're limited not just, but we're not really not just by the technique, but also by the Earth's orbit. If we were trying to make these from Mars, we could get, do an even further job, right? Well, we even, maybe end of life, we'll put it out by Jupiter, and we'll have, yeah. <laughs> or even <laughs> Jupiter, right. we have to right. wait a long time for the, That's the right. Time six, Jupiter. Yeah. right. It's a lot longer than six <laughs> months before you have to take the, uh, take the measurement, that's for sure. So, so yeah, this, right. um, just going back to this, uh, this new measurement with uh, with Hubble, um, is this a, a new technique that you've developed specifically because you've got this instrument in or in orbit, and it's um, it's an old space telescope now, and you've just basically applied it in a new direction and discovered new things with it by applying this brand new method. Is this a new method, or is it like a, is this a known astronomical method with with telescopes? Well, um, I would answer it this way: it's it was a method that was developed for Hubble to allow it to observe very bright objects without saturating, like exoplanet transits. Okay. And yeah. we have repurposed it for measuring tiny angles. So, so could th could this be used for like the James Webb Space Telescope? Is this like um, something that could be used on the next generation of telescopes to make them incredibly powerful? Because we're going to see. Uh, observations like we've never seen before with the JWST. So could this be used to complement the, the, those observations by advanced telescopes to help us see even further to actually gauge, uh, you know, high precision uh, uh, distance measurement of the universe? Stefano, would you like to answer? 
Uh, yes, well, it can be used by other telescopes. All you, what you need is something that's really, really stable, like HST is, and GWST hopefully will be as well. Uh, and then you can use the same method. It, the, the, the details are going to be different because the uh, uh, images are taken in a bit of a different way for jet, for web, but the the basic technique is going to be the same, can be used as, just as well. Um, and then maybe we can go to fainter objects. One of the problems we have is these stars that we are using have to be really bright because we're moving a telescope fast, and so if they're not bright enough, you don't get enough uh, photons, enough light in each, uh, in each piece. Uh, but uh, with with web, you can apply the same technique to fainter objects and maybe even with better precision. Okay. Now, I don't I, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but I just pulled up a paper from 1995 that quotes data taken on a photographic plate by Christian and Racine at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, and they use star trails to measure the relative motion of stars and objects more similar to the planet application that they were talking about was originally created for HST. So it has been used in ground based on data that I took. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you did so tend to rain on parades. You were the pioneer. No. We knew it. You're nice. No. That's why you, you were coming in. Okay. Serendipitously. It's oh. embarrassing. Sorry. But. Okay, we only have uh, we only have uh, uh, Adam for about another five minutes, and so we got to go. But I want to I want to get to a couple of one of the questions. One of them, uh, this is from uh, Toma, Thomas Thomas uh, Nosetti, um, who is asking, what were the first things measured with this new technique, and why? How about you? Why don't you take that, Adam, um, and then you because you got to go soon. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Go. Are you? Did you go? Oh, okay. Uh, Stefano, how about you? Well, in for for us, in in terms of this new technique with the uh, Hubble, the first objects have in fact been these Cepheid variables. They're so important to us because they're basically going to be our ruler for the size of the universe. Uh, but in terms of using the the just the trigonometric parallax method, that's been used for over 150 years and to find the distance of all nearby stars because it was the first way by which we could tell how far any star at all was. Um, so it goes back to about 1860, that's okay. that when it was first used. Um, but this new incarnation um, that with HST, with Hubble, it has been used so far only for Cepheids. Okay, and again, it's like you're, you're doing two things at once here. You're kind of confirming what we know about Cepheid variables and their brightness, the luminosity and periodicity relation, as well as uh, getting more accurate actual geometric measurements of these things. So Correct. One of two things at once. Um, Hugo Berman is going, uh, so it's still a parallax That's method, right. just more precise. And yes, the answer that is, is correct. That's right. That's what it is. Um, okay, and one more question from Hans Milling, and then uh, uh, Adam, I understand you've got to go. So um, what is the precision of these measurements? I guess they are more precise on closer objects than the old method, but at the limit, 10,000 light, but at the limit, of 10,000 light years away, or in this case, I think you're saying it's 7,500 light years. How precise are they? So, at the limit, how 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 confident are you? So, we're still working about on tiny details because this is very right. So, we think okay. at that distance, at the distance of about 7,500 light years, that we can measure distances that are good to about 5% precision. So, 5% uncertainty. Okay. So there you go. So that that's pretty. And and before we couldn't even get out that far. So this is quite an improvement uh, on on using this. And it opens up uh, presumably a whole bunch more targets that were previously unavailable by this method. That's so right. uh, that's going to increase our knowledge of Cepheid variables. I wish I had that's time, right. Adam. I want also... to talk about time one a type one a supernovae because that's another. That's where you made your. Uh, Mark, and so I guess I'll have to wait until another time. Will you come back? Will you do another one with me? I will come back with a better connection. Yes. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I understand you've got to go. Next time I want to talk to you about Type 1A supernovae, the expansion of the universe, and the accelerating expansion rate. I want to get all of that because... I just love talking to you about those things. So thank you, Adam, for showing up, and uh, I understand you've got to go. So, again... Thank you so much. Bye, Adam. Okay, so Scott, did you see any other um, 
any other questions I have? I've only been looking at the Q&A app. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking through, because a lot of the comments were first done on the announcement, so I'm having to go through the Hubble page. Oh, okay. um, and also a little bit on YouTube, which is more on, you know, I, I love that you know Dave English, even though it was being a little bit of a cynical comment here, says, didn't cavemen know about sine, cosine, and tangent? Which, yes. Not really. That was developed well, more with, uh, with the, <laughs> the, the, the you know, India and the, the Arabic world. Um, but it's amazing being able to use you know this very simple mathematics to be able to measure you know our stellar neighborhood. And now that we're able to go out further, we're able to use these newer methods, these standard candles, compare them to what we already know to get more accurate measurements of our close neighborhood so we can more accurately know things more further out that we can't directly detect with parallax. But now that we have a more precise way of knowing what's close to us, we can use that as a more precise tool. So, and it's, again, something that was discovered um, in the last millennia as far as sine, cosine, tangent, being able to use trigonometry in yeah, this way. Yeah, I don't way. think cavemen knew about that stuff. Cavemen didn't know about it, but... It, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know what that's supposed to be. I think it was more of a that's cynical comment. <laughs> but well, it, there, no, there's a really good book about that. It, it's called The House of Wisdom and how the, the Eastern world did discover these things, and now we're still using this very old mathematics to discover our stellar neighborhood. Well, geometry works. Yeah. <laughs> you get Go ahead. Yes, kids, pay attention in mathematics. <laughs> if That's I can add a comment, actually, the Greek astronomers tried to measure the movement of the stars, and because they couldn't see it, they knew they were far away. They just didn't know how far, because you, when you can't measure something, you can't. So they knew they were much further than the moon, which they could see the the, the shift on the moon due to the Earth's uh, size but they could not see the shifts in the stars, and so they knew they were much further away. So yeah, the method is, is old, but it's only become very applicable in the last 150 years. Um, in addition to that, I mean, like with, when using these, um, you know, high precision experiment, uh, high precision measurements with Hubble, um, is there any uh, warping due to, you know, um, space-time warping due to gravitational fields around heavy objects? I mean, is that a factor you need to work in, or are the distances just too small to really make that a, um, a significant problem because I know with frontier fields, Hubble's being used to, you know, uh, analyze these uh, lensing effects by um, uh, by the gravitational field of massive um, galaxies and clusters. Um, does that affect parallax um, uh, measurements when you're looking over these longer scales with Hubble? That's a good point. Is that a question to me? Um, sure. Anybody, anybody, yeah. yeah. In principle, yeah, you could see the motion of objects or the apparent motion of objects because some light is going past a, a massive uh, object. I mean, that's how, um, for example, general relativity was verified by looking at the motion, at, at how stars got displaced during a solar eclipse in the mm -hmm. early 1900s. Um, and you could see, you could design an observation to see this tiny shift due, for example, to Jupiter, and that would be an interesting test and measurement to make. During, as far as the parallax is concerned, um, you know, unless you're really, really, really unlucky and you just uh, have a, a Jupiter go in front of a star you're measuring the parallax of, then no, the motion due to um, the Sun or Jupiter or any other solar system body is not really large enough to make a difference. Okay. But in principle, you have to worry about it. You just have to be very lucky or very unlucky, depending on how you look at it. So the precision of this new technique then isn't really affected by something like that. Those shifts due to planetary body, planetary sized bodies then? No, basically if you take Jupiter, you get you get within uh, 20 or 30 uh, radii of Jupiter, then you can see the deflection due to Jupiter fairly clearly. But it's that level. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's less than the size of the, uh, of the Sun, basically. Well, actually it's just about the size of the Sun. Okay. If you were more than a degree from Jupiter, you can't see it. Well, the uh, uh, that brings to my mind something that I had heard. Uh, there's a there's an, also an astronomer at the Institute, uh, Kailash Sahu, who has discovered a way, or at least he's developed a way, to use microlensing to find stellar-sized black holes, and that's these sort of uh, lensing events where you know uh, stars or some object will move in front, or, or it will 
the black hole would move in front of a star or something in the for in the background and cause a small microlensing event, and that and that little flash is one thing they can use uh, to find uh, things that maybe wouldn't they wouldn't ordinarily be able to see. But that that's not what we're talking about here. But it brought that to my mind: uh, microlensing and gravity moving in front of other or gravitational object moving in front of others. Um, that's something that we. Uh, also need to have a hangout on at some point because that's another thing that I find pretty, pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we're still taking data for that. So there's another year to go. I'm a, I'm a member of that project. <laughs> oh, are you? Oh, yes, well, yes, great. fingers in many <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I thought he I thought he almost had the data for it though. I thought uh, two I thought three years. Years. we're huh? taking the thirty year worth of data. Oh, okay. Now. Well, okay, great. So I want to ask you a quick question. Then, how are you doing that? Are you looking at large areas of the sky? Okay, uh, are the, you just p putting together mosaics? How? What are you doing? Well, we're looking events? at a, an area around the galactic bulge where there are hundreds of thousands of stars within a single field, and okay. so because it's uh, they are, these micro lensing events are rare, so you need yeah. to look at uh, uh, many, many, many stars before you're lucky enough to see one. That's right. And so we are looking at this region near the, the galactic bulge, which has about 300,000 stars per field. So imagine just a one camera shot, 300,000 stars. And then the chances are that one out of, out of about a million will have a microlensing event. So by taking many, many observations, we probably should be able to see about maybe 10, 30, 50. We don't know exactly. Okay. Well, go oh, good. I'm glad you. I'm glad I, I. You brought. I brought that up then because look for me to invite you. So in about a year, you expect to have something uh, to talk about. Yes. Oh, good. All right. I so wanted. I wanted to go back to the distance thing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that the reason that we like to take the direct measurement is because it's geometric, and we can measure. Uh, directly the distance between the observer here on Earth and that object. But then we need to go further out in the universe. And the reason that you want to push the direct measurement out is because then the Cepheids will overlap with other known objects. And then you can bootstrap your way out. If you know how bright the Cepheids are and they're near something else, that you're, you know pretty well but not perfectly, then you can move out with more um, confidence when you build your distance scale. So yeah. that's the reason for worrying about trying to push the direct measurement further out. Yeah, that's again an important point. I don't think we stress that enough in the beginning is that, you know, these, you know, parallax is, is been one of the most reliable ways of knowing how far things are, way things are, and uh, so to get this as accurate as we can is 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 it's just too bad you can't. Everything go. else relies on how well that particular right. is the how the nearby stuff is measured. The more precisely we measure the nearby stuff, the better our whole ladder is all the way out. So that that remind, reminds me of a question, Stefano. What? What about proper motions of stars within our galaxy? Does this help us get a handle on that too? Like you're looking at a, at where a star is at one point, let's say I don't know, uh, 2014. We go back in 20, you know, 20 or whatever it is, another years later, and look at it again. Can we get some idea of how it's moving in in the galaxy? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, the one there's one little trick though, which is that it's really all relative. So we can tell very well how stars are moving with respect to one another. But unless we have something that's really stationary, like a, a the distant galaxy or a quasar or something like that in the field, it's very hard for us to tell an absolute measurement of the motion. And so that's going to be the limitation. With parallaxes, there are some stars in the, in the field that we know the distance to, um, you know, well enough to actually give us a, a, a basis, a starting point. Uh, but with promotion is a little harder. But yes, in principle, you can move. You can see how stars move with respect to each other very precisely with this method. Just yeah, as that makes sense because we're also moving in the galaxy, and so you know the mm. we get we have to take you have to disentangle all these motions to find out what the actual motion of the star is. Okay, well, Stefano, I know you've got to go too. You, uh, we've huh? we've um, we've used up all our time with you as well. So I want to thank you for uh, for being with us. Look for another invite when, uh, with you and Kailash. I want to talk about microlensing and uh, finding stellar-sized black holes. Okay. There is a oh, wait. There's a question? There's a question on Gaia. Oh, okay. Go ahead. 
Which in, I love. I love Gaia anyway. So um, how do you compare this method and Hubble's ability to ESA's Gaia mission? So with Gaia going out and, you know, essentially making a 3D map of a billion stars in our, our galaxy, um, how does this help us? Does it have any relation with the, the Gaia mission at all? Well, Gaia is going to do a, a fantastic job of, uh, of figuring out what the galaxy is like, where everything is in the galaxy, how fast it moves, and, and so on. Um, for an individual star, like for example for one of our Cepheids, we can do pretty much almost as well as Gaia, or maybe even a little bit better, it depends. Of course, of course Gaia just was launched uh, in December, so we don't know exactly how well it will do, but you know, if you plan, if you look at the planned position, we are going to be very close to its planned position. And depending on how bright stars are, we can do even better. But Gaia will measure many more stars. So in a sense, they are going to be complementary. We can do better maybe on targeted stars, especially those that are kind of a little bit fainter, because Gaia is a very small telescope, about one meter by half a meter. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Gaia will do many more stars. So I, I would see that as basically reinforcing each other. Very awesome. good. And actually, uh, real quick, before you go, Stefano, I want, uh, there's another question here um, mm -hmm. regarding another mission, uh, actually tying in with the big announcement today. So are we able to measure the distance to exoplanets using the, the method, you know, using this method uh, via the retask Kepler mission? Is Kepler, with its two flywheels, now able to be able to precisely that, or is that wobble going to be too too great to allow for any precise measurement using parallax. Kepler was designed to do extremely precise measurements of light, not so precise measurements of position. It uses very big point spread functions, so to speak, so it makes the star images big to make them, to measure the light better. So, but we can measure, we could use HST to measure the distance to the stars for which Kepler has found a planet, yes. Okay. That's Fair. definitely something that can be done. Um, I don't think Kepler would be ideal for that purpose, and the fact that it can only point in a limited way now also, of course, makes it much harder. In fact, impossible, as I understand the, the restrictions on its pointing. Um, wow, good question. That was a great question. Yeah. Okay, so... We can uh, reinforce each other as well, in that case. Well, I think it's a big, uh, big important note to make is that there are many of these missions out there. We have, you know, we have Hubble, we have Gaia, we have Kepler, we have these amazing space telescopes, and they're not standalone. There are ways that we can collaborate and build better data with these different types of measurements, with the different detectors on there, what their capabilities are to get a better understanding of our universe by using them together collaboratively. Yes. Exactly. Very okay. good. Point. Well, Stefano, again, I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, look for more invites. I hope you'll do another one with me. Uh, when you and uh, Kailash get your data all, all yeah, set we'll and published. We'll make sure to have a good connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, your connection was fine. It was Adams we had a problem with. So, oh. Yeah, so you you were great. So thank you so much. Thank I you appreciate you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, so um, I guess before we close, Carol, don't go yet. I want to I wanna talk a little bit, since we got a few minutes. I think we've got a few minutes. I want to talk a little bit about Kepler. Uh, 180, what was it, 87F or whatever it was? 186. Yeah, 186, yeah, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Um, yeah, did you did you watch that, Carol? Did you uh, see that? Part of it, um, I did get called out to another meeting. <laughs> oh, you got to go? Oh, okay. No, I, I did during the press briefing. Um, oh, I was okay. asked to go to another meeting. So anyway. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah. Saying. So, no. yeah, so it's a, it's a multi-planet system, and... Um, so they have been able to determine that it's about the right place, and uh, they have made an estimate of its 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 mass. Um, another thing that w it would be nice to know is what its size is, because uh, they were explaining that if you knew the volume, then you can tell what it's made of, whether it's rocky or whatever. But it's a really nice announcement. They are. It, this is showing. And they kind of, uh, this is showing number one, which they always said, is that they got to take data longer and longer and longer, they would be able to find smaller and smaller planets, which they have. Mm -hmm. um, and the ingenuity of using that telescope 
even though its reaction wheels aren't working very well. So, you know, my hat is off to them because they've really persisted and they are trying to make the best of their situation and they're they're doing well and going through their candidate list and, and trying to verify those planets. So that's very exciting, I think. Yeah, so let's summarize what for those of you who don't know what the what we're talking about, uh, Scott or Ian, you want to give a brief summary of what the what they what the announcement was? Go for Scott. So uh, uh, pulling up, there's some beautiful images here. I'm trying to pull up the. Uh, yes, the images that make this story. The, the <laughs> images are beautiful. There's a few uh, okay. well, made. While you're pulling them up, I'll just give a brief. So they've 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 discovered a an Earth-sized planet. That's really all they know so far. Like Carol was saying, uh, around an M-class dwarf star. They're calling it Kepler 186f. It's around Kepler, the star Kepler 186, which is the system itself. And here's Scott showing a diagram of what the system looks like, a schematic of the size of it. As you can see, it's tiny. Looks like it all can fit in the orbit of Mercury almost. Um, and it's roughly the same size as the Earth as you can see in the inset there. Uh, they don't know if it has an atmosphere, correct, Ian? Correct. I have no idea. I mean, this is the no thing. Idea. All they know is the size, right, Carol? I mean, that's, yeah. They know the size and they know its orbit. And they know right. its orbit. And, and so its orbital it, period is 130 days. It gets around one-third of the solar radiation from its star because it's an, an M dwarf. So it's a red dwarf star. So um, it's not getting as much radiation because it's not outputting as much as our sun is. So um, that's why if, with its orbit being smaller... And it's not receiving as much. You know, we're expecting something that close, like Mercury, would just to be blasted and bombarded. But since it is a a cooler star, it, we're not having to worry about that. So its heat on the surface is not going to be known until we understand what the atmospheric environment is, yeah. because that plays into you know that's how we have surface temperatures that are stable on our planet is because of our atmosphere. Yeah, and I remember uh, 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 David. I think it was David Charbonneau came to town and did a talk, and he said basically that he would look exclusively, if he could, for uh, for exoplanets or life on in the universe. He would start by looking with these dwarf class stars because they are around forever. They last a very long time. I mean, they have very long lifespans, and chances of finding life around them would be uh, much greater around something. And certainly, there's so many of them that that the odds are, the statistics alone are are enough that make it tantalizing that we're probably going to find something. Um, uh, the, sorry, I got distracted by a comment. Uh, be able to find something that uh, more more resembles Earth. Um, so, well, Carol, one thing you, you said a, that... If you have a very large, you know, much more massive star than the sun, that, that they have two characteristics. Um, they, they, they live fast and, and they die fast. <laughs> it might not be around long enough to have a planet actually form and have microbial life and things exactly. like that. That's right. Um, the more and they have. and the larger the larger uh, stars tend they end up varying a lot and they have star spots and stuff like that and that means the radiation changes. So that's not so good for trying no. to have microbial life. So so the M stars are are some of them have flares but some of them are, you know, nice small little constant stars and if you have a planet that's close to it and the radiation is right, it, it, it would have time to form microbial life and oceans and who knows what. Yeah, so one thing you said that I want to clarify though, this is this discovery was based on data they had taken over the past four years, isn't it? They didn't yeah, just... Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Didn't, okay. No, I, I was, uh, it, I was thinking about, they were still... No, my point about... My point was that they had argued, even though they were having trouble, that they should be able to keep taking data. It's the four years. Okay. That in two years, they can't get the precision for this. And, and that's why the first discoveries, if, if people look at the web page or you recall, the, the initial discoveries were very large planets. So you have a, a star and a really huge planet, you get the change in brightness. Um, but if you keep staring at some of the other stars, but you need... Um, 
longer and longer periods of time, first of all because you might find different orbits and also because you need the precision of the brightness to say, oh, was that blip really due to a planet or not? And and if it's a big planet, you're more confident, but if it's a little planet like a, an Earth-sized planet, you need me it to go around many, many, many times and you need to be monitoring that brightness change to a very high precision. So that's why you need a long time scale to keep staring at these objects. Yeah, and I guess based on the uh, the uh, the teleconference, are going to be uh, deciding. Uh, it's being reviewed now. This whole uh, solar wind pointing method they've devised yeah. to kind of stabilize. They're going to decide if that's what they're going to do or not. Right. So Rick Landon leaves a comment real quick. He says, uh, "What can we do to provide Stefano Castrotano nicer accommodations <laughs> in order to ensure that he is willing to return for more hangouts?" Uh, well, looks. Well. <laughs> Well, I asked him about that. I said, where are you, Stefano? Are you in a, uh, a warehouse? A warehouse? And, He's in uh, a boxcar traveling the country right now with his yeah. MyFi. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a great... Oh, put a blue screen behind him. Yeah, right? it turns oh, out he's in temporary something. accommodations. He's, yeah. uh, he's on sabbatical, yeah. and that was where the... Uh, those were the office arrangements. He uh, yeah, we, we did a great interview with uh, Leroy Chow, um, NASA astronaut, and uh, he was talking about space food. And one thing I was very aware of, he was basically inside a cupboard. He had all his clothes up behind him, socks hanging out of the cupboard. It's like, dude, really, <laughs> you don't have to be in the cupboard for this. <laughs> right, right, uh, the glamour, right. The glamour of science. Yeah, the glamour yeah. of science. Yeah, when you're on sabbatical, you get you get what they give you. <laughs> so, yeah, always make sure some books behind you if you're an academic. Uh, yeah, you know. so we, maybe we need to hang up a picture behind it. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and the remainder of that comment was, or show Dr. Risa our appreciation yeah. for persevering through the, the yeah. hangouts uh, with, the, with the network connection. I promise that the next time I have him in a hangout. I'm gonna. I didn't get to control where he joined from, but I. I think he was on a wireless connection that simply was overloaded at that point. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna make sure he gets a better connection next time. Um, okay, guys. Well, I guess um, anything else? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask a one quick question real here from the Q and A, just to okay. go over what as far as individual stars. It's from Paul Gracie. It says for measurement of stars outside of our galaxy. Can we use the parallax of our transit with the sun along with its path around the Milky Way? So stars that we're able to measure directly like this are within our own galaxy. Because, you know, that's how we're able to see these individual stars. The only time we actually get to see any big references to individual stars in other galaxies are when they're supernovae, when you have these big, when they really shine out and we're able to see these you know, very special moments. So being able to measure long distances like that using geometry would not be able to be used uh, for other galaxies. It's going to be within our close neighborhood of 7,500 light years now. Well, right, and our, our orbit, uh, the orbit of the sun around the galaxy is like 250 million years. So that was the question you, I was going to ask you. You, yeah. know, <laughs> you can't use the diameter of that orbit, and you can't use an orbit segment because we don't know it that we don't know it that very precisely. So you have to know that baseline very, very precisely for this to work. Yeah, but that's so, a good question. Yeah. So when I live forever, I'll make sure to make these measurements for you guys. And yeah. I'll let yeah. you know what's going well, on. Well, we should just send something and have it sit next to Jupiter, and then we have a bigger baseline. Yep, yep. My solution. Now let's just go to the Oort Club. Let's just okay. go all out. Okay, do that, and that'll take a very long time right. as well. Yeah, we'll need a lot of patience, for sure. We need a lot of patience. Well, I remember the early days in astronomy, you know, everybody thought it was static. They just did not see that much change in the sky, uh, other than comets appearing or planets orbiting around and, and doing their retrograde and things like that. It was so static, and now there's a whole field of transient astronomy, looking at things that change on, on time scales of months, days, and years. Uh, that I think and that's not astronomy what, being what done do you, by. What do you mean by I remember? You're not that old. I well. Yeah, you I, I, I want to marry you, Car <laughs> Carol. I'm gonna I'm gonna marry Carol now. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> You read that people thought that. You were oh, not old God. enough to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to marry Carol. Do, 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 do. Okay, oh, one I'm more question. I, I, I thought Tony was doing uh, doing his own research <laughs> on the luminiferous ether. I exactly. think that's how old Tony is. On ether, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, geez. Okay, so real quick okay. from Tomas. Again, one more. Would, would measurements be necessary? Would, be, would it be better if, would the measurements be better if the Hubble telescope was stationary, not in orbit, or are we in motion with our galaxy regardless so it wouldn't be still? I, th I think the spirit of the question is, does it matter if 
Hubble is orbiting the Earth while it makes these measurements. N no, yeah, whatever telescope on the ground or in space that you use, it's going to be moving. And that doesn't really affect it because we have stabilization. And we can hold, I mean, if you look at the beautiful pictures that Hubble takes, it's very stable. It can stare at a place in the sky at very high precision. And that's why this works is because we know if we trail it, it will be very high precision. So Hubble's okay being in orbit. It can be stabilized to look at one position, and we take advantage of that. 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the time, and it's only in these special cases that we actually drift it. Yeah, so, uh, and, and Hubble uses gyroscopes to, uh, to point stably, and those were just replaced in the last Hubble repair mission. Yeah. So, very it's, stable. Uh, it's basically a brand new telescope after that. So, um, okay, guys, I think All we'll right. stop there. Um, I don't see thank any other you. questions. So, yep. Thank you, Carol, Ian, and Scott. I want to thank you all very much for uh, helping out today, and hopefully you guys will join me in some more Hangouts in the future. You bet. All Absolutely. right. We'll be back. Okay. Thanks, all right. Thank okay. you, guys. Well, that's it for this week, guys, or that's it for this Hubble Hangout. Um, that's a wrap. Thank, yeah, thank you guys for watching, and as always, keep looking up.